It's a riff that both every budding and seasoned guitarist wants to master. The opening notes to Stairway to Heaven are iconic, and the Led Zeppelin song has earned the band somewhere north of half a billion dollars in royalties. The trouble is, a band called Spirit is attempting to block the track's re-release after claiming their late guitarist Randy California should be given a writing credit on the 1971 track. They and others say Stairway's famous picked guitar riff, written by Jimmy Page, closely resembles the guitar part on their 1968 song, Taurus. Spirit bassist Mark Andes reckons Led Zeppelin would have heard the song when the two bands were on tour together in the late 1960s. Nevertheless, songwriters have over the decades brought successful legal challenges to the group and its label, forcing them to pay royalties and add credits to songs they claimed as their own. However, there are only so many musical notes, chords and riffs that a person can string together into a song. So, over the course of decades, there's bound to be a little borrowing here and there. But when does this lurch into the realm of plagiarism? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined in the studio by Johnny Sharp. He's a music writer for Mojo and Q magazines, among others. Also here is Andy Milmore, a head of litigation at Harbottle and Lewis, and he's acted for music companies, book publishers, as well as many other clients. Um, also on the line, Chris Fielden, who is a writer, and Joe Bennett, who is a forensic musicologist at Bath Spa University. He's also the head of the annual UK Songwriting Festival. Joe, you have a guitar there. Can you play us uh, the two songs and let's let's have a listen to uh, the differences and the similarities? OK, well, the, the whole issue basically hinges around, uh, uh, around about a four-bar piece of music played using a descending minor chord pattern. So this, as everybody knows, is... Uh, the guitar part from Stairway to Heaven goes like this. And the, uh, the track Taurus by Spirit um, has a similar descending progression and this is the issue. So, so as a forensic musicologist, it sounds very similar, although there's a lot of aspects to that song, including a, a lot going on at the end of the song. That, do you believe he copied that? Yes, I believed he copied it. I think there's pretty much no question about that. It, it, it's a, a riff he had access to. It's a riff he'd, he'd heard recently. And it's not the kind of thing that would be terribly similar through coincidence. The, the issue is, is not whether it was copied. The issue is whether the thing being copied was in fact owned by Randy California in the first place. Can you copyright a minor descending chromatically in half bars? Maybe I should put that to Andy. Can you do that? Actually, I'm not sure that I completely agree with the, the way Chris has characterised the, the question here because I think it's pretty clear that any musical work, any literary work, which it's a fairly low threshold of originality, does belong as a matter of copyright to whoever created it. If it is entirely commonplace and standard and gone before, then there's nothing new and original. But once you hit that low threshold, you're the copyright owner in that work. And then the question becomes, two questions. One is, was there as a matter of fact copying? From what we know of the evidence in this case, it's suggestive of the fact that there could have been copying or maybe subconscious copying, a concept that was recognised in the, in the George Harrison My Sweet Lord case, where it was found that Harrison didn't know that he was copying, but nevertheless he was subconsciously. So let's assume that Randy California gets there on that. And then the question is, is it a substantial copy? And that's the legal test. Is there a substantial reproduction here? And then you start getting into quality questions about what has been taken, what has been saved and what's been reproduced is actually a very difficult question. I think the original could well be owned by Randy California, notwithstanding that it is a descending minor chord pattern, because it's the particular descending minor chord pattern in which his copyright subsists. Has that been taken or substantially been taken by somebody else? Chris, the, the song there, My Sweet Lord, by George Harrison was invoked and um, he always argued that although he had to pay out something like a million pounds, the essence of a song depends on its performance, its mood, it's not just restricted to what's written on a piece of paper. It's not quite cut and dried as to ownership of a melody, is it? With that um, Led Zeppelin example, to me it, it sounds way too similar to be regarded as just gaining inspiration. It, the Randy California version actually sounds like a Led Zeppelin song played wrong. <laughs> and 
I know it's Jimmy Page that is supposed to have copied it. I think the line should be drawn where getting inspiration is a theme or a feeling, but when you actually take the riff of the song, I think, personally, that, that should be regarded as plagiarism. Johnny, you've interviewed a lot of, you met a lot of musicians. Has any admitted to you that they've copied something or stolen something? Uh, the only people that have really been sort of uh, open about it, uh, someone like Noel Gallagher was always very, very open about like, uh, oh, I like that, I love that. And he got nailed for it actually over a song which was actually left off their second album, which was a, a very similar to Uptight by Stevie Wonder. Uh, it was originally included on What's the Story, Morning Glory and had to be taken out. Well, he had to say, yeah, they settled for $500,000 uh, on yeah, the yeah. track um, Shaker Maker, which... Um, oh, that's a different one, yeah. Um, uh, the Australian pop group New Seekers said it sounded a bit too much like I'd like to teach the world to sing, and that became well, a Coca-Cola yeah. well, advert. And well, so this also. is the thing. That was one where he deliberately included a snippet of that as a sort of parody, a pastiche of that. And yeah, he was consciously doing that, and he knew uh, he wasn't trying to hide anything in that sense, you know, which doesn't mm. make it right necessarily. Of course, it's, there's not many musicians do it. It's incredibly common for musicians to be accused of it you look at any amazon review of an album and someone will say i can't believe that they get away with this track it must be obvious to anyone with ears that this is a complete rip off of this other track one well, everyone thinks they hear sort of echoes of another track and a lot of the time musicians hear that a few years ago joe satriani the uh, rock guitarist sued coldplay because he claimed that they had uh, taken a little snippet of melody from one of his endless, self-indulgent guitar noodles. If I Could uh, Fly, it was called. Cool. You listened to it, and really it was like, mate, you're dreaming. This is a man with a, you know, like a lot of musicians, has a, a very large ego and believes he doesn't get the credit he, he deserves. He sees a band like Coldplay who get a certain amount of critical acclaim, although not... Not everywhere. Uh, and probably not but, from uh, you. But. Yeah, yeah. No, I quite like them, actually, but uh, a lot of critics don't. Anyway, but Satriani obviously, obviously looked at that and thought, I see my influence everywhere. You know, they're all ripping me off. It's more in his head, perhaps, than reality. As regards the Led Zepp one, actually, if it hadn't been Jimmy Page doing this, I might have been prepared to say, well, yeah, it is just a minor... minor chord. It's, it's not an uncommon pattern of chords, that dis you know, the descending pattern of minor chords, and even the finger-picking, the sort of... One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's hardly uncommon in the folk tradition. Or The fact is Jimmy Page has form, a lot of form, when it comes to appropriating other people's work. I mean, whether that would count in the court of law, of course, is, is, is uh, deba highly debatable, no doubt. Joe, just referring to that Joe Satriani versus Coldplay case, Coldplay said that any similarities to their track v Viva La Vida with them, um, if I could fly it by Satriani, were entirely coinc coincidental and just as surprising to us as to him. I suppose a lot of songwriters really, a lot of it is subconscious. Well, coincidences can take place, and in the case of the the Joe Satriani uh, track, I, I think that idea that uh, uh, starting on a minor ninth chord with the melody, which was um, um, and then over the the C chord. That was the melodic fragment that he was picking up on. My personal view is it's not beyond the realms of coincidence that two composers separately could come up with what is a relatively simple um, harmonic and melodic idea over, uh, over two phrases. The challenge with this kind of issue, and particularly the Randy California issue, is that everybody hears music subjectively. When a listener hears a piece of music, they're listening to quite a lot of information going into their brain. They're hearing not just the things that musicologists write about, typically melody, harmonic context, i.e. the underlying chords uh, and that which can be notated, but they're also hearing the production, they're hearing the instrumentation. So, for example, had I played you the Randy California track using a brass band arrangement, it would be technically the same composition and the same piece of intellectual property in terms of music publishing, um, but it would sound completely different because it would be played by a brass band. So the reason that a lot of people hear similarities can be influenced by something as, as simple as instrumentation. And because I'm sitting here with an acoustic guitar and played both examples on the same acoustic guitar back to back, that rather 
enhances their similarity as compositions in terms of listener perception. Chris, Paul McCartney made the point that a good artist borrows, a great artist steals. That makes the Beatles great artists because we stole a lot of stuff. He admits to uh, having a lot of different influences um, and perhaps influences beyond his control. The Beatles in particular came up with very, very original songs for their time and uh, had a very unique sound. While they might borrow ideas or get influence from from rock and roll and, and other stuff that was around at that time, they definitely put their own stamp on it. I don't think you could regard what they did as plagiarising. It, w- it was taking influence and producing original music. And on that point, Joe, just back to you. McCartney, he woke up one morning, he said he was sure he had heard the, the melody that was in his head. He, he thought he had heard it before, and he recorded it as yesterday. It turned out that the song that he thought he was copying... Uh, was an original, so even musicians don't know quite how they do it. This is it, and a lot of my academic research is is exactly that, investigation into the psychology of the creative process, exactly how do people come up with melodies. There's a lot of romantic mystery attached to it in in the mainstream media, and and of course songwriters maybe have a bit of a vested interest in in mythologising the process in, in that way. Every creator of music has heard previous music and is creating new material in that context. So when I interview songwriters, they they tell me that it happens all the time, that they accidentally, inadvertently, or even deliberately compose fragments for their own song that are taken from other songs. But normally that avoidance of plagiarism is, is a normal part of the creative process. You just go, oh, that sounds a bit similar. I'll tweak it until it doesn't. You're listening to Radio VR, the voice of Russia in London, with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing musical plagiarism with Johnny Sharp, Andy Milmore, Joe Bennett and Chris Fielden. What about the legal definition, um, Andy? I mean, how blurry are the lines between plagiarising and inspiration? I mean, what's the legal difference? The issue that we come across again and again is the dichotomy between an idea and the form of expression of an idea. And you see that in all forms of copyright works, it's not just music, but at at what point is what's been taken, the inspiration as against down at a level where it's the particular way in which that idea is is expressed. It's a real problem for the courts to, to grapple with any particular case. Uh, and therefore it's a, it's a real problem for artists and, and music companies when they're looking at issues like this. Just let me very briefly read some words from uh, Learned Hand, who's an American judge. Uh, he, looking at a, whether a film script was copied from or was inspired by a, a play, what he said was this, there's a point in the series of abstractions where they're no longer protected since otherwise the playwright could prevent the use of his ideas to which apart from their expression, his property has never extended. So that's okay. So then he answers your very question, Ben, and he says, nobody has ever been able to fix that boundary and nobody ever can. You know, helpfully, the, so, answer, so it's, it's, so it's, the answer is, is that it's still blurry. It is always going to be fact and context specific. Right. It's very blurry. And that's where it came, comes back to what is the evidence. And we will be looking at, if, for example, the Led Zepp case were to go to trial, we would be looking at opportunities for Jimmy Bage to have heard instances where we know he was there listening before we get to the question of Joe or other forensic musicologists saying Mm. look actually when I look at this from from my scientific approach I can't really see this was coincidence because Mm. the differences are so unique and special I have to conclude or infer that there was direct copying consciously or subconsciously. What about unintentional is that a defense? I think the answer is I wasn't aware is probably not a defence. And, and that's, again, it's an American case, but, but there was English litigation for it. And that's the, that's the George Harrison decision, that a court can find that you were copying and reproducing. And that's the test. Were you, as a matter of fact, copying without intending to, maybe even without realising? And the answer seems to be, yes, you can. You know, you've got to have pretty compelling evidence mm. to show that that particular track was around so much and you'd heard it so often that it was somewhere there in the back of your mind that, that you'd be... Mm. regurgitating it without even realising. But actually, it, it could be the case, and it's not a defence then. Johnny, I guess certain musicians have different attitudes to this. I mean, I, I read this interview that Tim Rice gave, and he said that when he had s- melodies and lyrics stolen, he was quite flattered by it. It didn't bother him. I yeah. suppose he doesn't really need the cash. Others are a bit more uh, prickly. Dr John made the point that you can't copyright the blues, you can't copyright a title, and, mm. and that Led Zeppelin are a bit unlucky. Their music's blues-based. Many blues songs are similar. Yeah, of, of course. I mean, and when you combine a musical pattern and also a lyric, 
which quite often Led Zeppelin have done, then that's when you haven't really got too much of an argument. Again, it was a, something uh, Noel Gallagher has done several times. He, I think the song um, Whatever goes, I'm free to do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. And uh, Neil Innes of the Bonsai Dog Doodah Band said that he basically stole that from I'm free to be an idiot, which went, I'm free to be an idiot. As far as I know, Neil Innes now has a credit on that one, along with the other ones that Noel Gallagher's given credits away to. If Noel Gallagher was going to steal the melody, da, 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 you might have got away with that, but to actually steal the first two words of then really you're in trouble but i agree it's very difficult when it's just the melody but even on that spirit one i think you could argue there are a couple of notes difference chris there was a big case in the in the 90s uh, a song by the verve bittersweet symphony well it was their biggest hit they had to pay out considerable royalties on that it was a sample that they didn't get um they didn't get yeah, yeah. didn't get clearance for it but those kinds of cases are quite rare aren't they chris as far as i know yeah they don't come up very often i mean most times when when you come up with a song that you want to actually borrow a part of then you you approach their publisher and actually ask permission to do so i mean i've done that before in bands i've been in we did a cover of mr sandman which is obviously a very old classic song and we approached the publishers and they approached the writers and they gave us permission to use it what was their reaction to your asking uh, for their permission i mean is, do you think there's a general reluctance to release that to, to allow you to do that they were they were really um welcoming with it we basically did a cover of the entire song but did it in a very different way to the original Obviously, the the original's all very happy-clappy, and we were doing a kind of darker version of it. So we sent them the recording of it, and they just they wrote back and said, yeah, you, you've got permission to use it, and they would get a percentage of uh, royalties from it. Was there any kind of uh, question in your mind that if they didn't like it, retrospectively they could withdraw their permission? Or We had to approach them. If, if they'd have said no, basically we wouldn't have been able to, to release the song. Why do you think... Andy, that some songwriters are quicker to reach for the lawyers than others, though? I think there's probably two reasons. Um, One is because they actually genuinely believe their artistic integrity is being undermined. So that's the pure artistic reason. Uh, And the other, to be honest, is, is financial. You know, some of the things we've been talking about show why that is, because once you get into something which on the face of it has a degree of similarity, there's always going to be a risk that one way or another there's a copyright infringement finding. Obviously, there are a number of cases that have have gone to trial and people know about, but there's an awful lot more that never have. Some of them we've talked about here and there are some urban myths around, but most Mm cases get resolved and they normally get resolved with a co-credit and, and some payment so but it's an expensive business to take it to court isn't it and that, that's probably why people would be reluctant to unless and initially unless they unless they really had the resources to do it, it it's it's a, an expensive thing to do um as a claimant and it's a spen- an expensive thing to defend as a defendant and, and i hate to say it being a lawyer but it, it is one of the areas where typically the people who really succeed are the lawyers and therefore it lends itself to early resolution. I suppose an added dimension, Johnny, in this particular story is that Randy California struggled uh, financially for most of his career, um, playing in bars and stuff like that, and and here he sees a song that he, perhaps he felt was his, and earning more than half a million, half a billion dollars. If you feel that that you've never been given your due, I think that's what happened partly in the Joe Satriani uh, case, I feel he felt you know, that he was only really recognised within sort of metal circles, you know, and he probably felt that he deserved more recognition. And But I do think there's a difference with, with the, like the Verve thing, for example, where I think actually now Alan Klein, you know, the former Rolling Stones manager, now takes 100% of the royalties from that song just because of that one snippet, because obviously he's a, an absolutely... Um, a very stubborn uh, negotiator. Do you, think that's, do you think that's fair? No, probably not, to be fair, no. Mm. It isn't, but that's what happens. That's what you risk. If you use a sample and don't clear it, uh, that's what happens. Because it also, uh, a similar problem happened, and it really changed the nature of sampling in hip-hop uh, when De La Soul re- released Three Feet High and Rising. They used a sample of, I think, The Turtles, who was like a late 60s band. They used a, a small sample of that, I think, and didn't clear it. And because of that, the law really clamped down on sampling. And then their second album had way less samples. It meant that the whole sampling culture in uh, music was quite sort of clamped down. Because that, that album really benefits from having loads of really weird and wonderful samples all over it. 
But sampling was re- in its relative infancy course, back in 1989. After, yeah, exactly, mm. and after that, people couldn't be quite as free and easy with it, and they had to, and people were really a lot more risk averse. So, with, with samples, Andy, that's a different uh, ball game, isn't it? You have to just to get direct clearance uh, if you're going to use it. I, well, I think today the vast majority of sampling is licensed, and as, as, as you and Johnny have said, 20, 25 years ago, in its infancy, there, there was a view that if you only took a small piece, you didn't need a, a license because it wasn't an infringement. So back to what I said earlier, looking at legally, is this a substantial reproduction? So you had people looking in the 80s saying, well, I've got a four-minute track here and I only want to take five seconds or eight bars or whatever it is. That's a tiny percentage, so that can't be a substantial reproduction. It wouldn't be an infringement. I don't need a license. And then what the court does is to look at it and say, hang on, it's it's not that simple. You know, over, over my career in a lot of different industries, there are so many urban myths out there. There's a three-second rule, there's a five-second yeah, yeah, yeah. rule, there's an eight-second rule. In <laughs> advertising agencies, there's a rule that if you've made four changes from your inspiration, you yeah. haven't infringed a copyright. And of course, none of these rules exist because it's down to the particular case. Is this substantially a reproduction of the original? Joe, uh, borrowing, stealing, reworking, adapting, I mean, they're an essential part of any artist's trade, in particular musicians. I mean, if a song does have many sources of inspiration, do you think that detracts from its originality? Well, it's all in the ear of the listener, isn't it? it it's dependent on the way pe- people receive it. To some people, things will sound very similar, to other people not. And it was, um, it was really great to hear Andy there talking about the, um, the urban myths, because as someone working in a university context and dealing with a lot of students who are working up new creative portfolios, all of those myths are absolutely true, and I've heard them both hundreds of times. You know, I'm allowed to sample two seconds, aren't I? I'm allowed to sample five seconds. I've even heard some professional composers say seven notes can be stolen, but eight notes can't. And of course, melody is much more complex than that because melody is not just what pitches you choose, it's where you place them rhythmically in the bar. These myths are still passed around musicians, even though the idea of a substantial part, as enshrined in law, is, is really straightforward to explain. As Andy says, it, it, it's, it's qualitative, not quantitative. You're listening to Radio VR, the voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. We're discussing musical plagiarism. With me in the studio is Johnny Sharp, the music writer for Mojo and Q magazines, Andy Milmore, head of litigation at the firm Harbottle and Lewis. On the line, we have the writer Chris Fielden and Joe Bennett, dean of the School of Music and Performing Arts at Bath Spa University. Chris, you've been in bands. I'm just wondering, when you write songs, do you ever have an element of doubt once pen is put to paper, once you've written something? Do you think, gosh... I hope this hasn't taken too much from some other artist. I probably don't worry about it as much as I should, to be honest. If, you, if you're worrying about that, it, it kind of takes you out of the creative mood and then you don't come up with a decent song. We were in the situation once where the guitarist came to us and said, um, oh, look, guys, I've got this brilliant riff. And he played it to us. And we were like, oh, my God, that's fantastic. Started jamming it and realised it was actually a note for note. It was a deep purple riff. So I think sometimes, subliminally, you do take this stuff on, but usually you'd recognise the fact that you've done it. So did you did you change the riff or did you did you just yeah, well, throw that idea away? We had to throw it away because it, it was literally identical in a slightly different key. But, you know, 99% of the time, the stuff you come up with is, is really original. You look at status quo and people like that who say they make their living off of three chords and stuff like that. There are so many. In fact, I was watching a really good video on YouTube the other day uh, by a comedy band in Australia, and they basically strung together four chords and sang about 100 different songs over the top of these four chords. So that kind of illustrates the fact that you are limited in music. You know, there are only so many notes, there are only so many patterns you can come up with. And it kind of illustrated how many big hits use the same kind of fundamental uh, structure but I think what you do as a band is put in your own influence and your own kind of feeling. Chord loops are extraordinarily common. I, I blog annually for my sins about the Eurovision Song Contest, and I like to count the number of chord loops that are in there. Uh, a, chord, a, a chord loop is usually four chords, and the one, one, five, six, four uh, riff, which is this one. <laughs> And it's so many songs, as the Australian band Axis of Awesome have pointed out. It's You're Beautiful by James Blunt. It's With or Without You by You Too. It's really just the framework that we're hearing. It's just the underlying harmony 
the melody and the lyrics, the things that really make a song original and uh, and unique, uh, are obviously different in each case. It's just just those chords that are the same. And as far as I'm aware, uh, no one's uh, ever asserted ownership of purely a four chord loop. Just on the lyric side of things, I mean, what about proving stolen lyrics? I think it's typically easier to prove. Uh, you see it less often. And Johnny gave the example of of, of where similar lyrics will help to, to prove a case of, of copying of, of, of the whole thing. You know, the cases that there have been, again, have a, have a fairly low threshold. There was the um, Robbie Williams, uh, Woody Guthrie, Loudon Wainwright track a, a few years ago where the original line, every son of God gets a little hard luck sometimes, especially when he goes around saying he is the way, was um, infringed by, I suppose, even the son of God gets it hard sometimes, especially when he goes around saying I am the way. Now, that was... You could say, yes, he clearly took something from the original. It was intended to be a parody. It was very few words. It was a pretty low threshold literary work in the first place. And what came out was actually different. Uh, that's an infringement. So, you know, people know this. And I think it's, it's easier to avoid with words. And the subtlety and nuances of, of music mean that there's a, a lot more there that you can be taking, you can be influenced by, or you, you may not be taking words, you know, much more black and white really and uh, Johnny just finally I mean I guess perhaps some musicians might feel diff differently as to how the music would be used I mean let's say it is plagiarised or whatever and it's used in a butter commercial yes. or it's used by a hip hop artist or yeah. something quite cool I've seen quite a few adverts where you can tell they've deliberately just changed one or two notes from a really well known uh, song and put it as their jingle and they obviously think that that's fine it's probably not fine and the other thing as well about the lyrical thing has, I wonder has anybody ever sued Morrissey for his lyrics because they are absolutely chock full of snippets of film dialogue. For instance, I mean, it's like you know, a jumped up pantry boy who never knew his place. Or that is from a from a film. I think his lyrics are packed with film dialogue that he's taken. And also songs like "Everything Depends Upon How Near You Stand to Me" is from "Take This Longing" by Leonard Cohen. I guess he wrote most of these songs in the early eighties. But again, this is all stuff which happens quite a lot. And like the Robbie Williams thing, it's considered a parody like a sort of like mm. a bit of a, a wink of like those in the know will know what I'm referring to and I'm kind of cleverly reworking it but you could argue they're stealing somebody else's intellectual property. Joe, maybe we're getting a bit too obsessed about trademarking everything and the magpie nature of songwriting may be uh, perhaps affected and impacted by high profile cases such as this particular Led Zeppelin case. Yes, and I think case law tends to gravitate towards that which can be easily proved, which is why a lot of it focuses on melody, apart from the sampling cases, of course. And creative people take their inspiration from all of the culture around them. As Aristotle said, you can't create nothing from nothing. So inevitably there will become situations where things just become so obviously or apparently close to one specific work and that's what it that's where it becomes um, problematic that uh, somebody says well hey that's my intellectual property i'm um, i'm going after you all songwriters borrow all all bands are influenced by other bands and you've only you can read any interview with any songwriter or band to to find examples of it it's only when it becomes a specific work um for example, uh, uh, Deep Purple were mentioned earlier, and one probably the probably the most famous Deep Purple riff is uh, Black Knight, which goes like this. And that song was released in 1970. Famously, the band were jamming that riff, and they took it from the 1962 track, uh, which is uh, which was a, a beat music cover version of George Gershwin's Summertime. That cover version was a cover version of a piece of music that was written by George and Ira Gershwin uh, and DuBose Hayward in the 1930s, which is summertime itself from the musical Porgy and Bess. So obviously it's a long way from Porgy and Bess and, and Gershwin in the 30s to Deep Purple in 1970. But really I think that just shows how cultural influence and musical borrowing can take very unusual and unexpected routes well that's a good place to leave it the tentacles of musical influence uh, stretch wide and back decades that's joe d joe bennett 
uh, who is a forensic musicologist at Bath Spa University on the guitar there. Um, also on the line, Chris Fielden, who is a writer. Um, joining me in the studio, Johnny Sharp, the music writer for Mojo and Q magazines, as well as others. And Andy Milmore, who is head of litigation at Harbottle and Lewis. Uh, we've managed to name check everything from Aristotle, Led Zeppelin, to Morrissey today. That's uh, that's a one off. Many thanks for all my to all my guests. This is Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brandon Cole. course of decades there's bound to be a little borrowing here and there but when does this lurch into the realm of plagiarism well to discuss this i'm joined in the studio by johnny sharp he's a music writer for mojo and q magazines among others also here is andy milmore a head of litigation at harbottle and lewis and he's acted for music companies book publishers as well as many other clients i'm also on the line chris fielden who is a writer and joe bennett who is a forensic musicologist at Bath Spa University. He's also the head of the annual UK Songwriting Festival. Joe, you have a guitar there. Can you play us uh, the two songs and let's, let's have a listen to uh, the differences and the similarities? OK, well, the, the whole issue basically hinges around, a, uh, around about a four-bar piece of music played using a descending minor chord pattern. So this, as everybody knows, is uh, the guitar part from Stairway to Heaven. goes like this. And the, uh, the track Taurus by Spirit um, has a similar descending progression, and this is the issue. And so on. So as a forensic musicologist, it sounds very similar, although there's a lot of aspects to that song, including a lot going on at the end of the song. That Do you believe he copied that? Yes, I believed he copied it. I think there's pretty much no question about that. It, it, it's a, a riff he had access to. It's a riff he'd, he'd heard recently. And it's not the kind of thing that would be terribly similar through coincidence. The, the issue is is not whether it was copied. The issue is whether the thing being copied was in fact owned by Randy California in the first place. Can you copyright A minor descending chromatically in half bars? Maybe I should put that to Andy. Can you do that? Actually, I'm not sure that I completely agree with the, the way and I think the original could well be owned by Randy California, notwithstanding that it is a descending minor chord pattern, because it's the particular descending minor chord pattern in which his copyright subsists has that been taken or substantially been taken by somebody else chris the the song there my sweet lord by george harrison was invoked and um he always argued that although he had to pay out something like a million pounds the essence of a song depends on its performance its mood it's not just restricted to what's written on a piece of paper it's not quite cut and dried as to ownership of a melody is it with that um, Led Zeppelin example, to me it, it sounds way too similar to be regarded as just gaining inspiration. It, the Randy California version actually sounds like a Led Zeppelin song played wrong. <laughs> and I know it's Jimmy Page that is supposed to have copied it. I think the line should be drawn where getting inspiration is a theme or a feeling. But when you actually take the riff of the song, I think personally that, that should be regarded as plagiarism. Johnny, you've interviewed a lot of, you met a lot of musicians. Has any admitted to you that they've copied something? Chris has characterised the, the question here because I think it's pretty clear that any musical work, any literary work, which it's a fairly low threshold of originality, does belong as a matter of copyright to whoever created it. If it is entirely commonplace and standard and gone before, then there's nothing new and original. But once you hit that low threshold, you're the copyright owner in that work. And then the question becomes, two questions. One is, was there as a matter of fact copying? From what we know of the evidence in this case, it's suggestive of the fact that there could have been copying or maybe subconscious copying, a concept that was recognised in the, in the George Harrison My Sweet Lord case, where it was found that Harrison didn't know that he was copying, but nevertheless he was subconsciously. So let's assume that Randy California gets there on that. And then the question is, is it a substantial 
copy, and that's the legal test, is there a substantial reproduction here? And then you start getting into quality questions about what has been taken, what has been saved, and what's been reproduced. It's actually a very difficult question. It's a riff that both every budding and seasoned guitarist wants to master. The opening notes to Stairway to Heaven are iconic, and the Led Zeppelin song has earned the band somewhere north of half a billion dollars in royalties. The trouble is, a band called Spirit is attempting to block the track's re-release, after claiming their late guitarist Randy California should be given a writing credit on the 1971 track. They and others say Stairway's famous picked guitar riff, written by Jimmy Page, closely resembles the guitar part on their 1968 song, Taurus. Spirit bassist Mark Andes reckons Led Zeppelin would have heard the song when the two bands were on tour together in the late 1960s. Nevertheless, songwriters have over the decades brought successful legal challenges to the group and its label, forcing them to pay royalties and add credits to songs they claimed as their own. However, there are only so many musical notes, chords and riffs that a person can string together into a song. So, over the